We asked our members about the organisational support they had available to them in regards to their mental health and well-being via the welfare survey and some in-depth interviews. A large proportion of respondents, 40%, were unaware of any services offered by their forces to support their mental health and well-being. And those who were aware of force-provided services raised concerns about the quality and availability. Data from the open text boxes in the survey revealed that the majority of bad reviews regarding mental health and wellbeing support were generally focused on overstretched or inadequate provisions, budgetary cuts and access problems. Occupational health but an appointment would take months and those that have been recently have stated that they are next to useless. It had used to be a good service, feedback from people I have previously referred, but due to the cutbacks there is next to no support for officers who have been through life-changing and traumatic events. Officers were also wary of the police service's attitude towards mental health in general with the majority of respondents reporting that they did not feel the police service encourages staff to talk openly about mental health and well-being and would not feel confident disclosing difficulties with their mental health and well-being to their line manager. Almost half, 45%, of respondents thought that someone would be treated differently in a negative way if they disclosed difficulties with their mental health and well-being. Is it any wonder then that one third of respondents who had previously sought help for feelings of stress, low mood, anxiety or any other difficulties with their mental health and well-being did not disclose this to their line manager? The decision on whether to disclose or not must be a really complex and difficult one to make and one that many officers perceive as having far-reaching consequences. Although the decision regarding disclosure is likely to be influenced by a myriad of factors, fear of negative consequences, such as being treated differently, or having fewer opportunities for promotion or specialisation, were the most frequently reported reasons in the survey, followed by concerns over confidentiality. Data from the open text boxes and the interviews that were conducted with officers revealed that there is still stigma in the police service around mental health and that officers don't trust the service to be confidential and treat them fairly. Depression and anxiety are still stigmatised, unfortunately. Most people say it as a weakness. I sought help from my GP when it all became too much because the workloads were extreme and relationships and morale between colleagues often suffered. That was about four years ago. I was medicated with antidepressants and things improved for me. I blame the stress of work for pushing me to that point, but I have to take some responsibility for not telling my supervisor I was unhappy and couldn't cope. I still take the medication because I'm too worried how I would feel if I came off of it. I'm convinced it helped me cope in this office, although I would never admit I take the medication because I say it as a weakness. I think people would be really surprised if they knew this about me. It is an officer's absolute right to choose whether disclosure is right for them or not. But we need to be promoting a working environment where they should be able to disclose without fear of negative repercussions. Sadly, of those who did disclose, less than half felt they were given enough support and even less felt that they had been given the right support. Although there is much doom and gloom in these results, there are also some rays of light. For example, almost 90% of line managers who responded to the survey felt somewhat or very confident in their ability to support someone they managed with a mental health or well-being difficulty. As a supervisor of response for four years, I've managed an officer who now has a diagnosed personality disorder after she became obsessed with me. I've had two officers with suicide attempts I manage a small team and I've suffered myself from mental health issues, therefore I can tell where my officers are in decline. I feel very passionate about safeguarding mental health of team members and myself, but it's from experience, not training. And many of those who reported disclosing difficulties with mental health and well-being to their line managers reported positive experiences in relation to dignity and respect, confidentiality and empathy. 
but this was definitely not echoed by everyone. Many respondents cited their line managers as causes of stress. There is far too much pressure on people not to go sick, when a lot of the time the illness is a result of the pressure they face at work. Previously I felt I had so much work that I couldn't cope, so I informed my line manager, but he did nothing except compare me to another worker who was apparently much better at the job than I was. This eventually led me to having a breakdown and a substantial amount of time off sick. I had no contact from work for over six weeks until I received a call from my DI telling me he had just realised that no one had been in contact and that I was also getting a new line manager. In the time I was off sick, which was approximately five months, I had four new line managers. I now work in a different department and have a really good line manager. The difference in managerial skills is very varied and can make or break a person. Although the importance of line manager support was highlighted by respondents, only 21% of respondents with line management responsibilities could remember being given training on supporting people with mental health and wellbeing difficulties, and concerns were raised about training availability, training quality, and various operational and organisational barriers in applying good practice.